Yeah, so thank you guys for that excellent uh, introduction, and I'm very, very pleased to welcome all of you uh, on this uh, uh, go to meeting today, and uh, very pleased to welcome uh, both uh, Paul and Beth uh, to this uh, Living Well with Myeloma webinar. So, um, hold on a second. Excuse me one second. Yeah. The, the slides need to be. I'm sorry, there's just a, a, a problem with the slides for a moment here. Okay. There no we go. No problem, Brian. Glad to be All here. right. Glad yeah, so uh, Paul, uh, you hear Paul's voice there, so please welcome Paul from the Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Institute. So thank you so much for joining us, Paul. This is on slide number one. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Brian, and a very warm welcome to everyone. And again, I'm so grateful to you and Susie for hosting these events, which I think are incredibly important for our patients and families. Thank, thank you, Brian. So thank you, Paul and uh, Beth uh, from the Cleveland uh, Clinic uh, Tosic uh, Cancer Institute. Welcome, Beth. Thank you very much. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'd also like to thank on slide number two our sponsors. We're very pleased to have three sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, Janssen, and uh, Takeda. Uh, if we have only one message to give uh, in this whole uh, Living Well call today. I think the main message is that for now at least, uh, for most of us, staying home, uh, really paying close attention to physical distancing uh, with uh, regular hand washing is uh, clearly the most important aspect, what we need to do today uh, to stay safe. Uh, with the notion that um, we also do need to stay connected, uh, mostly uh, electronically, unfortunately, for the time being. If we go to slide four, I just wanted just to set the stage by just summarizing the details of this virus that we're faced with, uh, the COVID-19. Uh, the 19 uh, refers to 2019 and the D refers to December. And so this virus, uh, emerged uh, in Wuhan, China uh, in December of 2019, uh, possibly even uh, slightly before that, as we're learning now. But this is a novel virus and uh, clearly highly infectious. Uh, we're learning a lot about this virus day to day, uh, but a key method of spread is by the droplets which emerge from coughing or from sneezing. And that transmission can be in the air and uh, from surfaces where these droplets might land. Uh, the, the biggest concern is close person-to-person -person transfer, which has been such a big concern for all of our healthcare workers who are working in busy emergency rooms and uh, inpatient units and ICUs where uh, there are so many uh, very, very sick uh, individuals. So key recommendations, uh, physical uh, distancing, staying home, which has been uh, difficult for, for all of us. And uh, we've been doing it for different lengths of time, uh, some of us uh, for about a month now, uh, some of us maybe for a little bit less. Uh, staying home, washing our hands, and really protecting from all outside contacts. And this has been a learning curve. I mean, how do we do that? Uh, we go out to get our groceries possibly, and then what do we do if the groceries are delivered? How do we maintain that uh, uh, proper uh, distancing? And uh, now more recently, uh, masks have been more broadly available and the use of masks uh, for individuals uh, to stop spreading it to you. And if you wear a mask, you would be stopping spreading it uh, to, to other people. Uh, and so uh, the, the first uh, aspect which I'd like to ask both Paul uh, and Beth is uh, how have these uh, uh, physical distancing and other measures uh, been working uh, for you in, in, uh, in Boston and in Cleveland? So maybe first, Paul, uh, are these the strict guidelines that you're living with day to day now? Um, absolutely, um, Brian. And I would simply say that um, in that context, um, we've been very impressed by how important they've been on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, how uh, critical it's been to um, in, in observe them on an ongoing basis. And certainly in the clinic, for example, um, we've been very careful um, to ensure that when patients attend, there's a very careful screening process. For example, um, you know, telephone calls are made 
prior to the patients coming to clinic to make sure that they are well and that they haven't had any at-risk exposures. And then when they arrive, they're further screened. And in that regard, there's a questionnaire and obviously we're practicing uh, full barrier precautions. And we've been very fortunate, Dana-Farber at least, that uh, PPE has not been an issue uh, and uh, that we've been able to provide that for uh, our staff and patients actually um, to date, which has been a blessing. Um, so I think it's been certainly an, a, very, a, a very dramatic change as Susie said, I would say unprecedented is exactly the right word, um, but I w would acknowledge strongly how important these, uh, these measures have been in, in making practice as safe as we can possibly do so. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, how about in Cleveland, uh, Beth? Uh, 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 has this been the standard of care in the community to use those types of distancing measures and the like? Well, absolutely, Dr. Dury. I have to echo what Dr. Richardson said. You know, our patients are, are screened um, from the phone and before anybody enters the Cleveland Clinic Enterprise, they will have their temperature taken again. Everybody wears a face mask to protect the spread of droplets, you know, not the, the N95 mask, but we've had a lot of donations of cloth masks as well so they can take them home and reuse them. Uh, we had a school closure um, in March, 16th and stay-at-home orders from the governor in the in uh, March 22nd or so and our numbers are flat we're so fortunate that we only have about 139 inpatients so far and we've we've uh, really flattened the curve unfortunately as you will probably discuss that might lead to a drawing out of the curve um, so we've seen dramatic improvements in our health system and our ability to manage our patients based on these physical distancings Absolutely, absolutely. So there are a lot of questions coming in, uh, and one of them I think is important we could touch on right now is uh, what has been the experience with uh, myeloma patients thus far? And uh, I know, Beth, we were, were talking about this earlier. I think it might be good to share uh, how many myeloma patients, uh, you have a very large uh, uh, collective experience there, how many of them have been impacted by the COVID-19 virus? Yes, so Dr. Dury, we have thousands of myeloma patients at both the Cleveland, Ohio location and, and Cleveland Proper, as well as um, the Florida locations. And of our thousands of patients, we only have two that have been diagnosed with COVID-19. And I think partly, I think it's twofold. First of all, I think our patients are really good at hand washing and protective measures. So that's one of the impacts. And secondly, we are really trying to keep them away from the clinic by employing telemedicine and telehealth um, opportunities, right. which we'll talk about later on. But um, so, so those things have been really, really important. So very few numbers of myeloma patients have been impacted. And then, uh, Paul, on your side, I think there's a lot of anxiety. Uh, so what, what has been the experience so far in Boston? Well, I think to be fair, that the, the obviously in in in, uh, in in the northeast of the United States, we've been much harder hit than Ohio, and an enormous credit to how Ohioans have have been so effective in in in, in as, as Beth said, flattening the curve. Um, Boston hasn't been as uh, Massachusetts hasn't been hit nearly as hard as unfortunately New York was by virtue of population density and all sorts of other factors. I would say um, the impact on myeloma patients here in our practice has been real. We've had some patients be affected uh, and very sadly we, 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 we've, we've lost uh, uh, some patients, but the majority of doing very, very well, thank goodness. And in that context, um, our rate of infection amongst the myeloma patients with the ability to test being obviously what it is, and at the same time, uh, our precautions um, has been gratifyingly low. And I, I would say that, that in that regard, um, we've been very pleased that we've been able to keep treatment going in terms of oral therapies in particular. Um, we've also been able to be um, sensible about limiting uh, visits so that infusion room visits are minimized. And we've therefore been able to hold the course with treatment, but at the same time, uh, maximize disease control uh, and, and also minimize risk to, for COVID-19 exposure. Okay, thank you very much for that. And yeah, so we, yeah, uh, thank you. So, so moving forward, uh, we, we've touched on uh, some of the uh, risk factors for uh, becoming infected, uh, and certainly having to come into the the medical health health care system is is one of them. And so, on slide number seven, uh, I've tried to summarize a little bit of the understanding of what are the the factors that might influence whether someone uh, could develop an infection or not. 
the the amount of the virus that someone might be exposed to is important, and we now are recognizing these uh, super spreaders where um, uh, there are individuals who seem to uh, shed a large amount of virus and have been the source of many infected uh, contacts uh, from uh, meetings. Uh, uh, there was one which was a, a 40th birthday party, and another one actually I think was in uh, Boston, Paul. It was a uh, the the Biogen uh, company had a, a big pharma meeting there, and a lot of people at that particular uh, meeting ended up spreading uh, the virus. Um, I think multiple exposures uh, may be important, uh, and we're starting to understand that there's a difference if the uh, virus is breathed in and goes to the lung and obviously could cause pneumonia versus possibly settling in the nose where um, there could be infection of the epithelium in the nose, which can cause loss of smell, uh, which is a characteristic feature. And this uh, seems to be linked to a, a milder uh, type of, of the disease. It's interesting that uh, drinking water seems to help where it can help to flush the virus down into the stomach where it, where it will be destroyed by the stomach uh, acid. Uh, the, the final thing is that we are starting to understand that there are different mutations and it does seem to be important uh, where did the virus come from that is infecting New York uh, versus uh, California or Washington or other parts of the uh, country. Uh, it's uh, quite reassuring to, to understand that, that although having myeloma and having a cancer diagnosis, as I summarize on slide number eight, slide number eight, what are the top medical factors that could be important? Age is obviously important. Strangely, men seem to be more at risk than women. Uh, chronic lung disease, smoking and, smoking and possibly vaping in, in younger uh, individuals. Uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and particularly hypertension. And uh, Paul will remember that we talked about the, the linkage between this and the fact that the uh, COVID virus uh, uses the ACE to receptor uh, as, as, an, uh, as an attachment point. Uh, asthma, kidney disease, and as we've been well aware, uh, nursing home residents is a risk factor and also very much uh, in a complex way, uh, African-Americans and other native uh, uh, groups are definitely at risk. Uh, and we should not uh, ignore some of the social and healthcare factors. Uh, uh, the uninsured uh, and obviously homeless and migrant populations, and the resources that are available. Paul mentioned uh, that in his uh, system, the resources are definitely there, and I know for sure they definitely are in Cleveland as well. And this makes a big uh, difference in terms of the speed of access to care and the type of care that can be uh, delivered. Uh, an issue that has emerged for everyone has been uh, food security, uh, how do you get your food and how do you protect yourself, uh, not just when you go to the medical clinic, but when you go to the grocery store and the, the idea that you could have a home delivery. Uh, and for those that might not be able to do that, who uh, live alone or disabled uh, and people who have lost their job or uh, are poor, uh, that there are uh, fortunately, uh, uh, many of you have probably seen this, that uh, resources and food banks uh, have really been popping up in a gratifying way to help those who are in a difficult or disadvantaged uh, situation. And so uh, I'll open this for uh, comments about uh, some of these topics from, uh, from Beth and from uh, 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 Paul. Uh, so so uh, Beth, maybe you could comment first on this. Uh, have you had issues related to uh, uh, food security, uh, questions about how people uh, uh, keep, keep uh, their groceries uh, stocked up? <laughs> yes, yeah, so many questions have emerged about food security. And again, our experience in Ohio might be different of that with more um, densely populated areas. But I think that that, that doesn't necessarily matter because Florida actually has a uh, you know, it's a little bit more spread out, but still has uh, quite a few cases. But anyhow, um, one of the things I tend to 
discourage my patients from doing is wearing gloves to the shopping stores. You can okay. wear a, a mask, but the reason I, I, I discourage using plastic gloves or disposable gloves is I think it gives you a false sense of security. Washing your hands and sanitizing your hands with uh, Purell are so much more effective ways to provide that barrier. Think of how when you touch your phone, if you get a phone call in the grocery store or whatnot, um, and then it goes all over your car and all over everywhere. So. So again, good right. sanitation is, is important. And then wiping down your groceries when you get in the house is good. Buying food, I think of the neutropenic precautions we used to use with our bone marrow transplant patients. Um, you know, if you buy a cucumber, try to peel the cucumber and, and an apple where you can peel the apple. Things like that uh, make perfect sense. And that's typically what I recommend. Right, right. So, so Paul, what's your uh, uh, feeling about that and some of the other issues about the the, the risk factors for getting infected. Paul? Well, I, I really appreciate it. I, I do agree with Beth. I think that the most important thing to... Uh, uh, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me, guys? Hello? Yeah, yeah, you, Hello? yeah you're fine now. Hello? Yeah, you're fine. Hello? Uh -huh. Oh, I'm so sorry. Hello, I, I, I apologize. I, oh, God, got you very nice. You were loud and clear, too. I, I just... I just wanted to echo very much um, what Beth was saying about food and the grocery stores, recognizing that the danger in grocery stores is primarily aerosol uh, infection, and therefore the wearing of a mask is essential. My advice to my patients has been really that they should not go to the grocery store under any circumstances if they have okay. someone else who can go for them uh, in family uh, uh, and, and, and friends as possible. Um, because I, I agree with Beth, I think the contact risk is, is there, but 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 probably not, you know, that false sense of security from gloving is, is a good point. But aerosol infection to me is the biggest worry. The good news, certainly in Massachusetts, at the, the stores that, that, um, that, that I'm familiar with, is that social distancing and policies are being very ag aggressively enforced there, which makes, I think, a huge difference. Um, I think broadly, if I may, to, to an area that I, I probably yes. have a little, you know, more, more kind of insight to, it would be into the comorbidity issues. I would say yes. that um, the, the issue here, and it does touch on the issue that you, you, you mentioned about um, the m minority vulnerability, I think it is, it is, it is primarily um, the, the comorbid conditions that are, I think are the drivers of this, be it hypertension, diabetes, uh, and anything that's associated with an increased vascular risk. And I think what we're realizing with um, um, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is it's uniquely endothelial uh, uh, toxicity that it carries or its infectiousness that it carries that results in endothelial injury. And, and Brian, you touched very nicely on the, the ACE2 question. And what we've realized is that there is more going on at, at the endothelial level that's relevant when this illness becomes uh, a, a, a problem in the context of, of, of the COVID-19 pneumonias. And, and there, I think this, this is a clue to why it's affecting um, certain groups more disproportionately. So I think for our patients, the number one goal, obviously, is prevention. Number two goal is, is, is rapid intervention if, 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 if infection occurs. And second thing to understand is, is, is some of the strategies uh, when disease becomes established that may be bearing fruit in terms of, of therapeutic intervention. But I, I would just echo the point that um, Beth made so nicely that primarily prevention is obviously our, our number one goal. Right, and I also agree with the idea that washing your hands and you know, wearing the gloves can lead to more complications, uh, putting them on and taking them off. Even although Sanjay Gupta had an excellent video where he showed you how to take them off, I still think you're probably better just to uh, be careful and wash your hands. Okay, so I'm going to move forward and we're going to get into an area, uh, so please don't uh, despair. I'm watching all of the questions that are coming up uh, online and we're going to get into an area now where we start to answer some of the very specific questions that are coming in. And so in slide number 12, risk factors for myeloma patients, uh, and so obviously the main thing is uh, if you do need to go in for urgent care, there's an increased risk of exposure. Uh, however, I, I think that uh, very rapidly, unfortunately, uh, uh, the area where patients come in has been changed such that it has become a much uh, different and safer environment. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I think that, uh, and I'll be most interested to hear comments from both about this, we have in the short term uh, changed our, our approach, uh, uh, realizing that patients who have active myeloma, they do need their new therapy at diagnosis and also at relapse. A relapsing patient needs to come in quite possibly and, and get active uh, therapy. 
however, if things are elective, if there could be a possibility to delay an autologous stem cell transplant, uh, that would be something to be considered. And maybe to not undertake a, a cellular therapy right at the moment, uh, to be very cautious about patients that have limited bone marrow reserves, and, and look closely at a need for higher dose steroids, and just double check vitamin D levels, which we know can be important in the ability to resist uh, viral infections. And so uh, specific areas of, of many questions I can see coming up uh, online here are the strategies to reduce the risks in the short term. And I'd like to emphasize that um, we, we do view this as a crisis that we will get through together. And so these changes that we're talking about, we are uh, anticipating and hoping that these will be short term where we want to reduce the risk uh, in these uh, upcoming one, two or three months where we could limit lab testing or try to do it uh, using uh, an entity like LabCorp where they have drive up testing capability, uh, temporarily reduce or eliminate coming in for a Zometa infusion uh, modify treatment to maybe make sure that your blood counts uh, stay good. Uh, if we can safely shift to an oral regimen for the time being and avoid an IV, uh, that could be okay. Although, as I said, some patients just need to have that IV therapy, uh, whether it be uh, a daratumumab or, or something that they really need uh, to achieve ongoing response. Uh, limit the use of stem cell transplant. Uh, and also a key point which probably Paul uh, can comment on is that uh, clinical trials are ongoing and they will be continuing. And, and we've been very lucky that there's a strong uh, a willingness to modify the protocols uh, so that treatment can be continued in these very, very difficult times. Uh, and so this is a, an area of uh, many questions. And so uh, maybe, Paul, you'd like to start uh, first on this in terms of how you have approached uh, some of those issues in Boston. I don't know where Paul has gone. Um, Beth, do you hear me? Absolutely, I can I can speak to um, how we've approached this. So our um, our program has agreed that if patients are in an excellent remission, we do not want to adjust their maintenance therapy, especially if they're just on oral lenalidomide, for example but right. we might delay and adjust some of the blood draws to minimize their risk of going into the lab. So um, we also have not changed people from IV therapies to oral therapies yet. We have been fortunate to flatten the curve to the extent that maybe we'll hold a bisphosphonate or a denosumab dose, but we won't, we'll delay it. We won't plan on eliminating it. I still think it's too early to stop treatment because we don't know how long this is going to go on. One of the challenges we've had, though, is in clinical trials. We have some wonderfully well-designed clinical trials that remain open, and if patients need those trials, then we'll minimize their risk of COVID by protecting those that enter our cancer center, but we're also going to still enroll if that's best for the patient, so their care is not going to be compromised. We're just going to try to protect them against infection as best as possible. Right, absolutely. Um, so, Paul, are you back with us? Yes, what's I'm, I'm sorry. I'm... Oh, yeah, my, my apologies, Brian. I just had to... No, no, Brian, can you hear me? I just had yes. to take another call, and I, I'm so sorry for that. It was just an, an urgent uh, um, issue I had to take care of. So, my apologies. And, and Beth, thank oh. you very much for, uh, uh, for, for leading that uh, response. I, I, would, I would echo... Uh... Brian, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, you're doing fine. Hello, Excellent, Brian. please. Yes. Yeah, I can Brian, hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Oh, good. Um, so, so basically, I would echo um, the comments Beth made, except for this, that we are being very careful about uh, about transplant, for example. We're collecting cells and then basically keeping transplant in reserve, not least of which because obviously there are now multiple other options that can be pursued that uh, show, at least in the short term, uh, equal efficacy. So I think that's appropriate. We're also very careful about the CAR-T setting because, of course, uh, in that setting where you're using uh, a, a, an experimental approach essentially still at the moment um, and you have sy syndromes like cytokine release syndrome, this can be very challenging to discern from, from, from the COVID infection. And obviously, for those right. reasons, we're being very careful with that approach and very carefully right. screening anyone who's coming into that. Perhaps different to what 
Beth is doing in Ohio, we're able to mobilize oral therapies in a, in a sort of very broad fashion. So we're able to use those as much as we can to limit uh, uh, intravenous treatments. But having said that, we're still obviously using our, our proteasome inhibitor platform strongly, as well as infusional antibodies. So we've been able to, to sort of tailor those to each particular patient uh, in that context. And I like your slide number 12 in particular, Brian, because we agree with you absolutely about reducing steroid exposure, um, you know, maintaining attention to things as simple but as important as vitamin D. I, I think that's an excellent point you make. Uh, and also, um, we're doing, as, 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 as uh, Beth mentioned, a lot of telemedicine we're doing uh, in spades to really help people be able to be cared for but not exposed. And then I'd finally conclude by one point, which is to echo uh, best point about clinical trials, we've been able to keep particularly our, tr our studies that involve oral therapies going, and we've been able to integrate with our research nursing team and our research coordination teams, as well as our research pharmacy, a very dynamic approach to getting medicines to patients, doing remote visits, checking counts locally, and keeping up um, with care. And I think Perhaps one of my most remarkable patients has been uh, an ability of one of my patients who actually lives in Norway, who is here, um, getting her oh back gosh. to in Oslo, keeping her on study and keeping her treatment and then handing over her treatment and research therapy to colleagues in, in Amsterdam. And she's continued on therapy oh. and continued to respond. And she's doing really well. And it's an example of how by just by being very creative and um, you know, being proactive, we've been able to, to, to keep patients on track in terms of their research therapy. Yeah, so I think that I'd like okay. to uh, really emphasize this, emphasize this point that that uh, the 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 goal is to keep patients safe, but also a goal is to really maintain the best treatment that that myeloma patients deserved. And so, if we do need to modify, okay, but really make every effort to maintain an ongoing response or maintain a remission uh, with with maintenance uh, and, and try to keep all of these things uh, going. So let's move ahead. Uh, I think that a, a big concern right now, we've been in uh, isolation, many of us for about a month now, staying mostly at home. Uh, and uh, what do we need to know uh, moving forward that will allow us to perhaps uh, start to uh, behave uh, uh, differently and start to return to some degree of a new normal? So I think that the first thing that we need to uh, know about on slide number 16 is that as things open back up, we need, to, unfortunately, to be aware that um, uh, infection can be transmitted from early asymptomatic patients. And so this is something that we all are going to have to be cautious about moving forward. Right now, um, the availability of testing has been a challenge. It's been mostly for uh, the acute medical situation, uh, patients who have symptoms, but a broader testing to get an understanding of how uh, broadly the uh, infection is uh, affecting your local neighborhood is going to be quite important uh, in understanding the risks uh, as we return uh, to some reduced uh, uh, of, the, of the distancing guidelines. Uh, an interesting thing, and I'll, I'll be interested if uh, either of you have, have seen this, is uh, some patients with early disease have noted a loss of smell as a key early feature. Uh, the other thing is that uh, infections have been emerging even with a lack of fever and some of the classic features, although I would say that the diffuse aches and pains uh, have been uh, pretty common in, uh, in people I've been in touch with. Uh, it's important to be alert uh, to any possible infection in your sort of inner circle of family and friends, as I summarize in slide number 17. Uh, and physical distance, uh, distancing, even within those groups, might be necessary. Uh, and it is important to try to push hard and get testing that would allow you to make uh, rational decisions. And uh, with the uh, broader availability of masks now and hopefully the broader availability of testing, it will be possible to do a better job in trying to figure out the best uh, strategies. Um, sorry, I think that what is a savior for many is the ability to go for a walk or a run. And so this is obviously uh, very important, uh, respecting uh, physical distancing and allowing you to be uh, somewhat social, as you uh, can see and interact with people who are out uh, doing uh, the same thing. And there's a strong consensus that this is helpful. Although uh, I will, on slide number 19, mention that you do need to be somewhat careful, especially if you're out walking in an area where people are running or biking. And this very important study from a, a Belgian uh, Dutch group 
uh, in slide number 19, it just summarizes how uh, particles uh, can be suspended in the air. Uh, if you're running along, they will be suspended in the air behind you for a little bit of a distance. And so uh, if you're in that environment, you might, might need to be a little bit more cautious uh, when you're interacting with other people who are running or biking or even people who are walking fast uh, past you. Uh, and also, uh, just uh, be uh, aware of, of the whole uh, family situation where um, if, if someone is having problems, it impacts everyone in, in, the, in the family group. Uh, and uh, even uh, children uh, are, are very upset and need to try to understand uh, what's going on uh, and how uh, it's affecting uh, their parents or their, or their siblings. Uh, and so uh, for, the, for the IMF, it's been really, really important uh, to connect everyone uh, socially, and so we are physical distancing. And so on slide number 21, we have social networking. And so uh, it's been really heartwarming for these meetings to occur. And this one was with the support group, group leaders about a week ago, and where we had a similar discussion to today and just allowed people to voice their questions and concerns and connect with so many other people who are facing uh, the same challenges and issues. Uh, and so uh, we're looking forward together to see, well, what is that longer term perspective, which I uh, comment on on slide number 22, or we're excited about maybe some treatments coming forward that will be helpful for those who get infected, uh, like the uh, plaquenil, the hydrochloroquine, uh, uh, plasma therapy that we're hearing about. Uh, unfortunately, uh, and we can get comments, I think it will be a bit of time until a vaccine is available, but I do believe it will be of a type that will be safe for myeloma patients. Uh, but I think that the big, big thing right now is to have antibody testing so that we can understand who has been a, a, a infected and who now is uh, in a safe position uh, with antibodies. Uh, and so uh, for this segment, I'll be interested in uh, feedback uh, from uh, both Paul and, and Beth on a number of these uh, points. Uh, so uh, Paul, first, uh, do any of these points strike you as especially uh, important uh, in your uh, situation? Oh, Paul's there. Oh, I, I uh, completely Beth, agree with your recommendations to patients and families on some of the new ones. Yeah, I, I'm here. I'm here. No, I'm here. I'm here, Brian. Brian, I'm very definitely here. Can you hear? Hear me, Brian? Hello? Yes. Hello? Excellent. Brian? Yes, yes, yes. Hello? Yeah, plus, yeah. Yes. yes. I'm sorry. I hope you uh -huh. no, no problem. Yeah. Um, so basically, um, I would say that – can you can you hear me, Brian? Can you yeah, good. Okay. Um, basically, I, I think your 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 first points about the issues yeah, of uh, exercise you, yeah. and family uh, uh, interactions and so forth, and also most importantly, you you can good, Brian. And most importantly, some of the safe physical distancing guidelines based on that study from Europe, I, I think, are very helpful. Um, I think at the same time, um, in terms of some of the newer treatments, I really do think there are some exciting and promising new leads. So I do agree with you. I think um, this, the, these comments that you've made uh, uh, very much resonate with me and make a great deal of sense. Uh, hello, Brian. And, uh, and Beth, on your side, uh, are it's, all your patients out totally taking the Bronx and Cleveland? Dr. Yes. Yes, everybody, Dr. Dury, everybody is taking walks in Cleveland, but they're maintaining physical distancing. Uh, it's funny to see these uh, see individuals walking around with masks, but I think part of the problem is we're not able to test everybody. You, you mentioned quite clearly that this is transmitted from early asymptomatic patients, and I have quite a few patients that have tested positive for, for COVID that have not had any symptoms, you know, non-myeloma patients necessarily, but uh, maybe MGUS patients, and so they tend to have a little different perspective. But uh, we just don't know who has it and who doesn't. So I recommend to patients to stay as healthy and active and maintain your physical distancing, but also a healthy, balanced diet. I think that's critical importance. Um, also, the guided med meditation, yoga, anything you can do from your, your home. Uh, you showed that nice slide of Robin Tui and the support group leaders connecting. And I think that's the advantage. In 2020, we have all of these internet resources. And I've been teaching my patients um, from afar to use not only the telehealth um, distancing, but teaching them by phone how to FaceTime their loved ones. And, and you can still connect socially by maintaining that physical distance, which is of critical importance.
Yeah, yeah, some some very good points. Uh, and and strangely enough, uh, you know, the telemedicine uh, is not all bad. Uh, it does give you dedicated time with the doctor who is focused on your needs. And uh, so you maybe are not going into the doctor, but you do have his focused attention for that block of time and, and can get a lot uh, done in terms of making plans. Uh, 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 a series of questions have come up about um, the risks for patients with MGUS and smoldering myeloma. And I think that the answer to that is that there is probably some uh, increased risk. But as we commented at the beginning, uh, remarkably, myeloma patients have uh, been uh, very much spared of, of many of the, uh, the higher risk uh, issues with this COVID virus. virus. So I think that the Im immune compromise that we are aware of in patients with MGUS, smoldering myeloma, as well as active myeloma, is definitely real, but it hasn't seemed to put uh, patients at an extreme risk related to the COVID-19, certainly not as much as we were concerned about. Okay, so let, let's move forward, uh, and just for a matter of awareness, and, and you guys can comment as well, I think that uh, just to be aware uh, for, for, for patients who might uh, have serious issues with the COVID-19, particularly the pneumonia with lung issues, it's been encouraging to see that every day there are new ideas uh, of how to get the patients through these very extreme lung issues. One of them on slide number 24 is that laying patients on their stomach helps. Uh, also, not rushing to use a respirator, uh, that sticking with low flow oxygen can actually be okay. And then one very clever move is to use uh, uh, inhaling nitrous oxide, which used to be called uh, laughing gas, uh, it increases this as, as a mild anesthetic, actually. It increases the blood flow in the lungs, and it's been noted that this increases the oxygen flow into the blood. And then, of course, uh, the use of this medicine, the anti IL 6 uh, monoclonal antibody, which is commercially available for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, the, tr the use of that to get patients through this shock uh, or crash syndrome, which is uh, similar to the cytokine release syndrome, that has really been heartwarming, uh, especially uh, the other day, one of the emergency room doctors up in Washington, D.C., was basically saved uh, by use of this particular approach. Uh, on slide number 25, we're all watching very closely for how some of these new or active therapies against the virus might be uh, working, uh, the antivirals, uh, the, the Plaquenil. It's very interesting to see that Selenex, or recently approved for myeloma, does have antivirus properties, and uh, a new study has been activated to evaluate that. There's a lot of excitement about the use of plasma from individuals who have recovered from the COVID-19, and uh, there are also plans to develop a hyperimmune uh, globulin. It's, it's also interesting to see that many of the pharma companies that we work with closely related to the myeloma drugs, uh, for example, Janus, Janssen, Sanofi, uh, GSK, uh, other biotech companies, and then Takeda have established a joint partnership with a, a biotest uh, partner, uh, all looking at this area of either uh, vaccines, uh, or uh, plasma infusion. So, so many companies are, are trying to uh, contribute and help out. Uh, the fact that the BCG vaccination used for tuberculosis might protect against the virus is also an interesting point. Uh, and as we, we're trying to, to kind of summarize here in the latter part of this uh, call, uh, the question is, uh, what will the new normal look like as we move forward through the summer months? Uh, well, I think that physical distancing will probably continue for a bit of time. We will continue with the virtual social networking. Uh, the availability of the antibody tests and broader availability of the COVID-19 testing will really be essential to identify what is going on in your own local region. Uh, and uh, with the broader availability of masks, I think that wearing them in public will become more of a standard thing. Uh, telemedicine will be, I think, used more and more. Uh, clinic visits will uh, continue. Uh, they will hopefully expand from just urgent visits to as hopefully as close as, as possible back to our usual paradigm where we'll be able to use uh, uh, our IV infusions and move into uh, some of our clinical trials uh, which have been so important in the recent past. Uh, I, I do think that traveling will uh, be uh, uh, limited for a while, although 
uh, some of me uh, some of us uh, will be ready to have uh, some traveling uh, uh, for our sanity, perhaps a little vacation if it would become possible. Uh, and I think that people want to know, is it, can I get through this without getting infected? Well, actually, with physical distancing, since only a small percentage of the total population are infected thus far, it is possible with caution that you can avoid getting infected uh, in the short term, and this is certainly something that should be uh, a goal uh, to, to try to stay safe for as long as possible until a vaccine uh, is, uh, is available. Uh, and so uh, on slide number 28, I'd give you sort of a personal timeline of what I see. I think that for April and May, I think that we will mostly continue in a stay-at-home uh, mode. I'm very much hoping that in June and July we will be able to uh, transition back to some norm normalcy, uh, uh, which hopefully we can achieve by August and September, uh, and then move into a, a new normal, which I think, uh, unfortunately, will probably include some degree of testing uh, with an antibody testing in our future. I, I unfortunately uh, think that might be the case, and also testing to make sure that we don't have uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, and so uh, there are a number of questions here that I, I can uh, see that we can pick up on. But first of all, uh, uh, Beth, uh, can you comment on what you uh, envisage as the, as the new normal coming up uh, through the middle part and into the fall? Uh, I 100% I concur with your timeline, Dr. Dory. Um, I, many of us had canceled numerous trips and even just to drive down to see loved ones, I think is a challenge to put your life on hold. I think the new normal is going to include telemedicine. Much of the feedback I've received from the video visits, um, whether it's by FaceTime video or a HIPAA compliant uh, link, if patients have that ability for technology, is very positive feedback. You're saving money from having to jump in the car, limiting your exposure, and really, overall, we're still having a lot of the same outcomes. So I think telemedicine is going to be more integrated into our daily activities. Uh, we're also going to probably change a little bit the way we manage myeloma, and I'm really excited to see uh, we're going to be collecting patient information to look at outcomes after this pandemic. You know, we make our treatment recommendation based on excellent randomized phase three or phase two data, and maybe right. there is a little more wiggle room in those recommendations to kind of balance that uh, quality and quantity of life. So, uh, so thank you for sharing your timeline, and I do concur. Right. And, and Paul, what is your reaction to that, uh, particularly uh, the, the, the key elements of the new normal that you see? Well, I, I, I really like your timeline, Brian. I think it's appropriately conservative. I mean, I think the virus is going to dictate where we are. I don't know that too much else is, to be frank, at the end of the day, because this is such a new experience. I mean, this virus is truly novel, and how it impacts upon us will not be a short-term issue. It's going to be a long-term issue. So I think that Beth nails it by saying that, you know, there's going to be a whole new world we deal with, with telemedicine and appropriate management. But in a very kind of optimistic sense, I loved your slides on on the novel strategies. And I think that one thing uh, to share is just as we've been very busy um, in the myeloma space as, 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 as caregivers adjusting to provide optimal myeloma care, it's been a privilege to be also part of initiatives to try and beat the virus directly. And I think that you touched, Brian, very nicely on some of the new strategies. I think a couple of points to make here, and probably worth some discussion. There's a lot yes. of uh, uh, controversy about hydro hy hy hydroxychloroquine, Plaquenil, right. and I, right. I think the message there is to be careful of a lot of retrospective data that's been touted as you know definitive evidence that it does or it doesn't work. I think hydroxychloroquine combined with azithromycin in the outpatient setting. Um, must be obviously carefully discussed with your treating physicians, but it's something, you know, we have been using. And for better or for worse, we've not seen toxicity, especially for short exposures, as long as it's not given to patients with cardiac conditions. And at the same time, um, anecdotally, we've seen some benefit if it's used early. And the critical thing is to use it early. I really right. like your remdesivir argument. I think that that, I think, will come through, recognizing that's an intravenous therapy and will take time. 
I personally am really uh, in, intrigued by the data around Selenexor. Um, was first made aware of the fact that the virus hijacks XPO1, which is the target for Selenexor, some time ago in some very enlightening conversations with uh, uh, um, Michael Kaufman and the team at Carrier Farm, where they've really done a brilliant job in developing um, the science behind this. And then there is a randomized trial that you alluded to, where the trial, the drug is given 20 milligrams three times a week, uh, and it's a randomized study that's opening across the country. And I am aware of cases in New York of myeloma patients being treated um, with Selenex or for their COVID pneumonia. And of course, these cases are anecdotal now, but as far as I'm concerned, it's all hands to the pumps. Um, sure. Both of the patients did, uh, actually did remarkably well. So I think there's real hope with some of the treatments. I, I really like the hyperimmune immunoglobulin plasma infusions. I'm aware of another patient, a, a wonderful story of a, a, a very a very severely ill pregnant woman with, who was seven months pregnant, and she was successfully saved with an anti-serum infusion. Um, right. And there are these stories that are very real. I, I like your Absolutely. point about the BC. And that's relevant. And then I just want to close by just on, on the terms of the therapeutics by touching on this whole issue of um, the uh, endothelial target. And certainly we know that, that this matters. And I, I would just say watch this space, uh, Brian, because I think yes. the ability of the endothelium is going to become very important. Very, very good. So thank you for these uh, really uh, helpful uh, comments. Uh, I'm just going to touch on a few questions that have come up uh, uh, online here, uh, questions about the testing. I think that um, there are questions about the antibody testing, for example, and I think uh, it's going to take us time uh, to, to figure out what is the best antibody test and what does it mean, uh, uh, as well as uh, the pattern of uh, direct COVID-19 testing. It seems that the COVID-19 positivity can maybe come and go uh, as patients are recovering. And so we have a lot to learn about these tests and clearly uh, a number of patients have got uh, questions about those things. Another question just to touch on is, uh, what about someone who has recently gone through an autologous stem cell transplant? So obviously, an aspect of this was that we did not want to overuse uh, uh, precious PPE uh, uh, resources uh, to put a, a patient through. But for someone who has gone through it uh, with care, autologous stem cell transplant is actually a very safe procedure. And so for someone who has actually gone through it, uh, I would have e every expectation that they should be able to come through it uh, in good fashion with careful uh, attention and coming into a protected clinic uh, area. And so uh, let's uh, try to finish up uh, on how we uh, can all try to face uh, these COVID in infections. Uh, one way is to build up uh, our resilience so we're ready for any challenge. Uh, uh, on slide number 30, uh, the COVID-19 is uh, a life-changing challenge, that's for sure. All of our lives have changed. Uh, and so we need to assess, well, what are going to be the impacts of this uh, virus on our, our lives in the future? And I think that um, uh, at home, we have time on our hands. We can be thinking about what, what will be the plans that will make a difference. And it's important to focus and come up with best solutions uh, and enhance our resilience uh, to kind of move forward together collectively uh, using uh, social uh, connections. Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, we can have a, a moment for some uh, final uh, thoughts as we uh, approach the, uh, the witching hour at the end of this uh, seminar. So uh, maybe a final thoughts, uh, uh, maybe from you, Beth, first, uh, uh, as we uh, enter uh, a whole new period of challenging times uh, in this year and moving into next year. Uh, words of wisdom for our patients. Yes, this has been, thank you, Dr. Dury and Dr. Richardson. This has been a very valuable discussion. Uh, I think it's just important to encourage patients to stick with it. Try not to be socially isolated while physically distanced. Maintain your general health. And rest assured that your, your physicians, your nurses, your healthcare team are working to balance that risk of infection, minimizing 
trips to the brick and mortar cancer center while trying to best manage your care. Um, continue to wash your hands, as Dr. Dury said, avoid people with known infections and know that you might have a little different manifestation. Maybe it'll be loss of taste. You might not mount a fever because of your chemo treatment. Um, and just report any, um, any, uh, any symptoms you might have. Uh, we have a very liberal COVID testing protocol. Anybody immunocompromised at my institution can get tested whether you're symptomatic or not, although you're more likely to be positive if you're symptomatic. Um, but we are moving in the next week or two to testing everybody. Um, so stick with it. This too will pass. And um, it, again, thank you so much for having me today. Well, thank you for all of your wise uh, and helpful comments. And, and Paul, some final thoughts? Absolutely. Very much to echo Beth's very kind comments. I think these seminars are incredibly informative because I think the essence of, 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 of taking fear away from something as, as challenging and as formidable as the COVID-19 crisis is knowledge and information. And I think that what uh, you've emphasized so beautifully, Brian, is the, the value of simple practical things. Uh, and I think we, we, we don't need to reiterate those. But I want to end on a very hopeful note, which is that I think that novel therapeutics will defang this disease and in the context of defanging its worst complications really help to push it back recognizing that vaccinations are challenging but in the same time those will come and in the meantime we'll develop supportive care and therapeutic strategies ranging from antivirals to small molecules to endothelial strategies that will literally take away um, the deadliness and i think by doing that um, we can all then look to a new normal uh, after this is 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 God willing, uh, uh, you know, put in the place that it needs to be. Absolutely, Paul. Thank you so much for that. And then maybe just some final uh, references to some of the questions. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety about well, will myeloma patients be able to travel? Uh, uh, one question about cruise ships. I, I think we're all pretty wary of a, a cruise vacation right at the minute. Uh, but I think it will be safe for us to travel uh, with, with proper precautions uh, moving forward and uh, with uh, enhancements of treatments, uh, with testing, and with hopefully a, a vaccine on the horizon for next year, we will be able to return uh, to a, a functional uh, new uh, normal. And so uh, I, I want to close uh, uh, from my point uh, with slide number 32. Uh, which just emphasizes that uh, we will get through this together. I mean, there have been lots of crises in the past, uh, and uh, we in the U.S. and the global uh, uh, population, uh, uh, we are resilient as humans, and we will get through this together. Uh, and we are uh, connected uh, globally. Um, I show you a picture there of an ap apricot tree growing in the, in the garden of our uh, leader for Europe, uh, myeloma has no borders, and I, I really do like uh, the uh, sentiment from David Hockney, the, uh, ar the uh, artist, who says, do remember, uh, they can't uh, cancel the spring. And uh, here in Los Angeles, I was just so, so happy to look up about a week or so ago and, and see this message in the sky written by a, a sky plane writer uh, saying, we will get through this uh, together. There is a strong uh, sense of uh, camaraderie and hope and, and uh, coming together to really work through this in the best possible way uh, for everyone. And so this is a silver lining to what we are going through at this uh, uh, somewhat dark time. Uh, the, the IMF has put together uh, a COVID landing page where we've tried to uh, uh, bring together all of the most pertinent information about myeloma patient safety and the coronavirus. And this I, I detail on slide number 33. And uh, again, uh, I'd like to thank our, our sponsors uh, who have helped us to make this uh, possible. Uh, and with that, I would turn it uh, back over uh, to Susie for our final uh, thoughts and com comments and commentary. So Susie, I turn it over to you. Obviously, while I'm waiting, uh, I, I, I am enormously grateful to both Paul and Beth 
uh, for contributing so uh, beautifully t- uh, to this uh, uh, teleconference today. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Uh, and absolute pleasure, Brian. Absolute pleasure, Brian. Any, any time. Really a pleasure. Uh, and uh, Susie, uh, are you there? Uh, looks like your microphone is muted. Uh, all right. So, 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 Robin, I don't know if you would like to make some comments until uh, Susie uh, is able to rejoin us here. Sure. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Jerry and Dr. Richardson and Beth, of course. As always, our myeloma community has come together to educate and support each other. So I'd just like to give a few reminders to everyone that um, while we are all doing our part and physically distancing from each other, the IMF is still here for you. And while our entire staff is working from home, we're available. We encourage you to email the IMF info line at infoline at myloma.org or call us at 800-452-2873. We'll not be able to respond to you in real time, but we will absolutely get back to all questions. So please keep those questions coming. In addition, the IMF has a Seattle patient and family uh, seminar that we wanna let you know has been rescheduled as a live webinar, very similar to this and similar to what we did earlier with the Boca Raton Patient and Family Seminar. So they're now available live and you can look at the IMF website to sign up to be part of that webinar. So the date for the Seattle webinar will now be Saturday, May 9th. And again, check the IMF's website for details, as well as all other ongoing IMF events. Please just stay tuned, and especially to that landing page that Dr. Dury showed you on the coronavirus. There's so many updates yes. there. Yes, um, I slipped and, back and to that, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and yes, please. So it's right, if you go to myloma.org and you scroll down and you find the picture that looks just like this one, You just click right on that. You don't have to worry about typing that whole big long um, address in there. So um, thank you again and our sponsors making these valuable webinars possible. Again, Bristol Myers Squibb, Janssen Oncology, and Takeda Oncology. And most importantly, thanks to everyone on this call tonight. We were up to almost 900 people on this call. So it just shows uh, the the strength of our community and the concerns that we all have today. We sincerely hope you found this hopeful and helpful and stay informed, continue to have those important conversations with your healthcare team. And uh, I wonder, Susie, have you been able to get your mic open? Susie, no. All right. Uh, I, I'm I'm sorry that she's not able to rejoin, but I know uh, I can speak on her behalf that she's just uh, uh, most grateful uh, that uh, Paul and Beth were able to join today, for example, and that uh, we were able to be in a position to uh, provide this information uh, uh, to such a large number of people who were uh, uh, anxious to to be informed and and try to be as safe in these uh, crazy times. So thanks to you all uh, for for being on the call and contributing uh, quite a lot of questions. For those that have not been answered, uh, we will try to follow up on a number of those. uh, And we do have our info line, uh, as you're aware, and those will be made available to the info line. And so I think that uh, we will try to follow up as best we can uh, with, with those that we haven't directly answered. So thanks to you all. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Yes. Thanks have so a, much, have a great everyone. evening. Thank take, you so take, much. Take Save, care. Uh, be, be safe, everyone. Be safe. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Brian. Thank you so much. <laughs>